Hello, and welcome to the Accountability Coach Podcast, where we discuss proven business success principles related to helping you make more money and work less so you can enjoy having your ideal business and your ideal life. This is Ann Backrack. Today, we have a special guest with us who I know you will find to be a wealth of information related to helping you accelerate your path to your ideal state so you get there much faster than you otherwise could and giving you more time to operate at an optimal level. Aaron Trahan has a 15-plus year progressive background as a senior level executive leader within public company corporate environments and early stage startups. As a certified leadership and executive performance coach, Aaron leverages his background and training to support leaders with the implementation of systems, mental models, frameworks, and growth programs that allows them to accelerate their path to operating as the best version of themselves and reaching their full potential. Well, welcome, Aaron. We really appreciate you joining us. Hi, Ann, and I very much appreciate you having me on. I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. I am too. So so that we're all on the same page, let's just start with what is a performance mindset? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, one of my favorite topics. Thank you for asking. You know, I, I, I will kind of give you the origin story of, of what's led me to evolve my thinking to come up with, uh, and I know it's not completely unique, but kind of what I refer to as the performance mindset. And, you know, I think we've all, you know, learned from the great work that Carol Dweck from Stanford has done in really helping bring the fixed versus growth mindset into kind of the mainstream awareness. I think virtually everybody kind of understands the fixed mindset, you know, going to be those people who have the behaviors that don't really like change, don't want to rock the boat. They prioritize, you know, status quo, being content, whereas the growth mindset there is that underlying thought and belief that with the proper amount of time, energy, and effort, you can enhance your capabilities. It's not fixed based on what you were just born with. You can increase your intelligence, develop new skills, and have kind of the fortitude from a thought process to be able to overcome the obstacles and just have that belief that nothing can hold me back. If I'm truly committed to it, I can achieve it. And what I've noticed throughout the years is, wow, that mindset is great. I can't support it enough. But what I really started to realize with so many people raising their hand to the question of who here identifies with a growth mindset, I was noticing a common theme that those people were just as quote unquote stuck as many in the fixed mindset group are with just kind of being stuck in status quo or stuck in a comfort zone. And it really started to strike me that having the right thoughts and beliefs is important, but if no action is going behind it, they just stay thoughts and beliefs and you kind of remain in that comfort zone status quo. And so what I really help bring to the surface is really that next level to a growth mindset. And that's what I refer to as the performance mindset, where it is all about having the bias for action. It's all about having that will willingness to leave the comfort zone, getting uncomfortable, being challenged, being stretched, and actually looking for those opportunities because you know that is where the growth lives. Um, so really what separates the two, I kind of think about the growth mindset being or starting where or the uh, the performance mindset starting where the growth mindset ends and the big differentiator is that willingness and desire to take the action required to see the improvements and and, and the development that you know sits behind uh, that leaving of the comfort zone or that getting uncomfortable. Yeah, I always talk about successful people are comfortable with being uncomfortable all the time. That's how they get to be successful. And so you can, too, learn to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yes. So I yeah. think that's really powerful. Yeah, I, could, I couldn't agree more. And, and what's also interesting, another wrinkle that kind of comes into that is, you know, a lot of this shows up 
after success has been achieved. So once you've achieved success, and I see this with a lot of business owners, kind of entrepreneurs who have kind of, they've, they've proven out some concepts and, you know, it's just natural that after some wins, after some achievement, after some success, it's easy to kind of slide back into, all right, I'm going to coast a little bit now. I'm going to take my foot off the accelerator here. And we all tend to become a bit more risk averse on the other side of success. And that's really the danger zone of where so much of this can show up. Sure, you may have all the right thoughts. You may have all the right beliefs. You're posting all the right things on LinkedIn. But if we were to zero in and really look at your actions, your habits, your behaviors, your routines, there's very little action to then back up the growth mindset. And it's so common after people have success. And so it's kind of the what I also kind of refer to is this could easily turn into the downside of prolonged success. Interesting. So what do you think are some of the common blocks or blockers that prevent us from reaching that next level, whether, you know, we're in the fixed and we want to be in more of the growth or whether we are already successful and had some successes and now we're a little bit more complacent. What are some of the common blockers that prevent us from really going to that next level? Yeah, that's a that's a super thought provoking question. And thank you for, for bringing that up. And, you know, really what I continue to see over and over and over is some derivative and or variation of the fear of failure. And when we think back to early on in our careers, when we're in our early 20s, there wasn't really anything to lose, right? So the the fear of failure wasn't as great as it is kind of in our later later in our careers after we've developed a reputation, we've developed a name for ourselves, we've kind of developed a really solid track record it's that fear of failure that I continue to see makes leaders, business owners, entrepreneurs, you know, once once some of that success has been had, it, you know, we, we're, we kind of start saying, you know, I, I'm not sure I want to go rock the boat. I'm not sure I want to um, take on kind of the fear of failure. And I think what sits underneath that said very bluntly is I think once we reach a certain level, we are afraid to suck at something we're, we're we can say all the right things, but actually getting into something where we're back to being a beginner, where it requires that learner's mindset, where we got to get back in the growth zone. It's much more comfortable to hang our hat on prior achievements and kind of consider ourselves accomplished or the smartest people in the room and dish out the guidance and advice rather than being the one who is continuing to be a relentless learner, way, way more difficult to be a relentless learner uh, than it is to kind of be the one dishing out opinions and, and advice. And so what I like to pose the question to a lot of leaders that I kind of work with and, and entrepreneurs and business owners is just imagine what would happen if we redefined what the how how we define what failure looks like. And instead of not achieving instead of the fear of falling on our face instead of you know the fear of maybe looking foolish in front of our peers imagine what our lives businesses businesses and careers would look like if we redefine that definition to failure simply meaning not trying i think a lot of things would change and it would directly pierce through that fear of failure that only grows as our career and success grows because we don't want to look foolish. We don't want to look stupid. We we don't, as easy as it is to say, a lot of people don't like being uncomfortable. And that's exactly the feeling that comes with being in growth mode, being in a learning mode and operating at the very outer edges of your current capabilities. Yeah. Don't you think, I mean, it, to me, it really comes down to fear of the unknown because they don't really know. What's going to happen? Are they going to fail? Are they going to suck? Are they going to, you know, have somebody say something? And when people push through to that, and correct me if I'm wrong, isn't this what you find as well, is when they really push through, hey, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to suck it up, put my big boy and big girl pants on and do it anyway, and just see what happens. It's not so bad. 
And a lot of times it's way better than their brain, you know, envisioned anything would be. So oh. they really didn't fail. They really succeeded. And it really wasn't so bad, which then helps them take that next step the next time that they're afraid of failure, or afraid of the unknown. Is that what you find as well? You you couldn't have said it any better. And, and that's exactly right. And I think, you know, the one thing and, and why I love talking about the performance mindset is because you can read all the books, you can read all the articles, you can take all the mastermind, master classes, whatever it is, but always know there is no substitute for taking action. And regardless of where we're going in the future, AI, whatever it is, is like, that's, that's going to be a universal truth to growth. I think there is no substitute for taking action. And, you know, emotions tend to reward action. You know, fear is always going to be the highest before we take that first step. We're always going to be the most nervous and anxious and stressed before we kind of jump into the arena. And exactly what you just said, we find out a lot very quickly once we start taking action. And what we typically find out is, okay, this is not as bad as I thought it was. I wish I would have taken action much sooner. And it really kind of goes down to that major perspective change of, you know, not waiting on the perfect opportunity. I mean, there, there is no such thing as a perfect opportunity. And so when we kind of change our perspective around, Failure and thinking about any new launch, any new initiative, any new new action we're looking to take, it is all a series of imperfect action. And also what you explained was something called the competence confidence loop. And so when you get comfortable with being able to take imperfect actions, knowing it's not going to be perfect, knowing there's going to be a ton of learning on the other side, there's always an increase in competence that comes with taking action. And any time that our competence grows in one area, we're going to have more confidence from that higher level of competence. Once we have higher levels of confidence, it then creates this flywheel effect where it's much, much easier going forward to keep taking those imperfect actions that lead to progress, that lead to development, that lead to learning, and I just I can't stress enough to any business owner that fear or, or failure is not the opposite of success. That is a myth that we've been told for way too long and where it needs to be recalibrated is failure is an absolute part of our journey towards success. And I think once we can get our minds wrapped around that and not treat failure as some fire that we can never touch and become so risk averse that we never grow, the faster it is that we start taking those imperfect actions and getting all that wisdom and knowledge and learning that come from some of the, the missteps that are going to be inevitable. This is awesome, Aaron. This is really great. I love this. So how do you suggest that we basically deal with taking action when we are afraid of failure, we're afraid of the unknown, we're afraid of whatever it is, you know, could happen. What are the first steps to really get us to unpack and actually take that first step kind of into the abyss, maybe, as you might want to look at it, yeah. or into what we don't know is going to happen? What do you yeah. recommend as, you know, the first step or steps that we would take to help us unpack that to jump in? Yeah, yeah. A, a great transition to kind of developing an action step here. And, you know, I, I think the one important thing that's going to be the preface of everything I'm, I'm about to say is there is no downside to being over prepared. And there's a lot of great quotes out there, but one that I kind of always, always kind of thought about and, and has stayed top of mind for me is are you really prepared if you're not prepared for worst case scenario? And how I translate that to kind of back to your question is how do we deal with the unknowns? And my answer to that and, and guidance to, to the people that I work with is what if we can start thinking about how to convert the unknowns into knowns? 
And one exercise that I think every business should be should be taking advantage of and leveraging is what I refer to as um, and, and you've probably heard about it before, but it's called a pre-mortem exercise. I think a lot of a lot of businesses, when they look back on what went well, what went wrong, what what should we change? If you think about the perspective of the vast majority of meetings that we've all been a part of seeking that improvement um, and improve performance, it's always been reactive. We're always looking back into the future. And so I think a great way to spin that on its head is, well, what if we can move that process, move that what worked, what didn't work up front before we take action, before we launch a new product, before we launch a new business, take that new initiative and think about it in terms of a pre-mortem exercise. And this makes people uncomfortable because part of what this exercise is all about is for a business, you almost want to fast forward out to 12 months, 24 months, whatever time period that's that's best applied to whatever the topic at hand is, is almost assume failure. Let's assume this business. Let's assume this initiative. Let's put ourselves in the position that this was a massive, massive dumpster fire failure. Everything went wrong. Now let's work backwards from there. Let's think about as a group, what were the things that happened to make this a failure? What were the catalysts? What did we miss? What get all the ideas in in the middle of the table around what is it that would be the highest probability things of happening that would lead to failure? When you can convert some of those unknowns and just create the space in the forum to have that conversation, get those things in the middle of the table, all of a sudden now your preparation goes to an entirely different level. Once we can convert those unknown scary ghosts around what could hold us back, let's meet it head on. Let's talk about it. And how do we build a strategic roadmap that incorporates those things, but most importantly, makes our strategy such that we can minimize, if not fully eliminate, the risk of those things happening. So I love to forecast out in the future, we have failed. What we're about to do was a massive failure. Now let's think through what made that the case and how do we plan around those obstacles? How do we proactively make sure that those things don't happen? And if you do that well, and if you do that consistently, I think it's um, it really takes that burden off the shoulders of a business owner around not knowing what could go wrong when you're intentionally planning for what could go wrong, but building a strategy to ensure that the likelihood of those things happening stays extraordinarily low. Let's take a simple example. This is so great. I'm just so excited about this conversation here. So let's just take a small example. Sure. Let's say that. I have call reluctance. And how do I unpack that to get over having call reluctance? Because I'm afraid of what people are going to say. I'm afraid of how they're going to treat me. I'm afraid of failure. I'm afraid of all these things. How do I get over that to help me pick up the phone and make the calls I know I need to make to get the results I'm looking for? Yeah, I think we add we add layers to it. So you just you just identified some great bullet points. I'm afraid of X, I'm afraid of Y, I'm afraid of Z. We're not gonna let those sit out there in the abstract. We're going to define precisely what that looks like. And so if we're afraid that someone's going to be mean to me or, or if someone's just gonna tell me no, what does the next level look like? Well, what what how would that come out? Why would they be mean? Why what would make them say no, for example. And so I think when you can actually put color to the abstract kind of thought, get precisely what that unknown is known. What is, let's, let's get as detailed and defined as we possibly could about each one of those bullet point areas that you just mentioned and that list, we can then say, okay, this is what is the likelihood of failure. So if we fail, we don't make the calls, whatever the goal is, our our fear of failure is this. So if we know that that's what we're afraid of, if we know that that's the risk to success, we can now sit back and strategically say, 
what can I do to minimize that? What can I do to eliminate that? And I think that's where the great part of this pre-mortem tool comes in is because you're not just planning the strategy of just making the calls. You're now going to a whole different, deeper level of strategic thought of how am I going to make the calls in such a way to where these fear items or this list of fears or list of failure risk, how am I incorporating something within my approach, my strategy, my script to where I can proactively meet that head on and remove that obstacle from the table. And so those bullet points that you just mentioned, that is so frequent with where I see businesses stop with the strategic planning. What I say in using the pre-mortem exercise is go deeper. Tell me exactly what that looks like, exactly what that feels like, exactly what that comes out as. And now the strategic thought comes into how do we build a script, strategy, plan, initiative to overcome that proactively, not on the other side of failure, looking back and say, oh, well, that's that's why that didn't go well. It's like, no, let's assume that that doesn't go well. What are we going to do to change that from a proactive stance? And so I think it's all about going to a whole di different, deeper level. Don't let things float out there in the abstract. Tell me exactly what that fear looks like. Tell me exactly what that risk looks like. Because the clearer you get there, the better your strategic plan is going to be. Excellent unpacking that. Now, I've seen that you've written some really thought-provoking words that I'm just I'm going to mention to you, and I want you to a little bit unpack this for us. Hmm. So I read that you wrote, thoughts lead to beliefs. Now, keep in mind, thoughts can be good or bad, right? Negative or positive. Hmm. So thoughts lead to beliefs. Your beliefs drive your emotions. Your emotional state influences behavior. And your behavior is directly linked to your results. So let's talk a little bit about initially the first part of that, your thoughts, good or bad, positive or negative, which influences your results, which is the back end of that whole statement, right? That's right. Yeah, I think where, where our attention goes is where our energy flows. And so, look, there is... I don't care if you're the Dalai Lama or whoever else. We all have both negative and positive thoughts. What is a controllable for us is where do we, where do we invest and allocate our attention? Are we going to harp on the negative thoughts or are we going to, to fight to choose to focus on the positive thoughts? Cause there's, there's, always two lenses that we could look at any situation through, and that's either the negative lens or the positive lens. And so what I love about that, let's just call it a, uh, that little equation is it's a great reminder for me that we always have to realize how powerful our thoughts are. And when we can fully appreciate how powerful our thoughts are, it's going to make us really, really Think before we give too much attention to negative thoughts, because the same thought, thought over and over, turns into a belief. The belief then will drive our emotional state. Our emotions drive our behaviors, and our behaviors are always going to determine the results that we generate. And so it's a good way to tie back. Look, we, we all have goals. We all have aspirations. We all have dreams. But when we look at where we want to be, this is an easy way to tie it back to the initial seed of thought. And so if we can be very present with where we're putting our focus and attention, I think when we can bring this, for lack of a better term, equation to be more top of mind, we're going to have at least one more layer of friction before we put too much attention on negative thoughts because we know that there's a, there's a, linked, uh, a linked system that too much time spent on negative thoughts will absolutely 100% impact our behavior, which then is what's going to drive our results. And so one of the best quotes that I could use to sum this up is I love 100 year old wisdom. And so this is from Henry Ford way back when. And the quote is whether you think you can or think you can't, you're always going to be right. 
And I think that's what perfectly sums up this thought to results equation. And it's just a great reminder to just appreciate and admire the power that our thoughts hold. And so if you're wanting to achieve next level results, it's going to start with having next level positive thinking that kicks off this chain reaction. So yeah, it's just a, a great way to, to never discount the power that our thoughts have and which thoughts we're giving that power and attention to. That is so well said because you're giving power to negative and positive thoughts, whichever you choose. That's right. So here's a big question for you then. Since most of us think about what we don't want to have happen, Instead of focusing on what we do want to have happen, how do we recognize or identify or smack ourselves in the face when we are having these thoughts about what we don't want to have happen? Or you can call them negative thoughts or, you know, the the thoughts that are going to take us down the path we don't want to go. How do we, first of all, really recognize those immediately and then change our pattern to what we do want to have happen? Yeah, yeah, great question. And, and, you know, I I, I hate to kind of come back to to beat uh, the the previous topic, but I think where it starts is with just having an appreciation of how these things are linked. And so if you sit around and stew in negative thoughts all day, every day, you can't have the expectation that, that attention going to those type of thoughts are going to generate the results that you want. So I think the first thing is using an equation or some type of, you know, some type of mental model that this is of just having the understanding of what can happen if I hold on, if I give too much attention and focus on these negative thoughts, we just have to know first and foremost to have the awareness that this will show up in my results. I think that's number one. The other more execution piece to this is then how do I shift, right? So now that I have the awareness that, okay, if I, if I have these negative thoughts, it's ultimately going to show up in this whole chain reaction of beliefs, emotions, behaviors, results. How do I get away from that? And I think I'll sum it up with basically one word and it's attitude. I've come across a study and look, I'm a big uh, I'm big into meditation. Once I, you know, found meditation, it, it changed my life. I feel like it just reprogrammed, rewired how I think and, and, you know, how I process thoughts. And I came across a, a tool or a tip from one of my meditation teachers one time. And they informed me that as great and as powerful as the human brain is, it can't do this one thing. And that one thing is, Our minds, our brains are not able to be negative and extraordinarily grateful at the same time. And so the big, I I guess the big cure for too much time spent in negative thoughts is then shifting and really asking yourself, zoom out, what am I grateful for? What am I truly grateful for? Whether my personal life, my, my professional life, yes, things may be going wrong, at work, in the business, whatever it may be, but there's still something that you're going to be grateful for, whether it's the opportunity, um, being able to show up and run your own business, being able to provide jobs for other people. There's always something to be grateful for. And I think when we can combine those two things, having the awareness of the power of thought, and then two, we can't be negative and extremely grateful at the same time. Make sure that you always create those fork in the road moments for yourself that when negative thoughts come up, you catch yourself spending too much time on them. Always take that other path. You can always shift and go into the lane of gratitude and gratefulness, and you will be amazed of how it just back to the what the human brain can and can't do. The focus away from negativity almost almost immediately goes away. And so. For me, what I've learned and what I've personally experienced is that focus on gratitude is an extraordinarily powerful tool to beat down negativity. Maybe one simple thing to do might be to simply when you first wake up in the morning and when maybe when you go to bed at night is just say, what am I grateful for? 
That's and that maybe gets you started on the right path for the day. I I am a firm believer that 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 single what appears on the surface simple question that you just said can't be used enough. So whether it's what am I grateful for to start the day? What was I grateful for of what happened today? Whether it's a negative situation is like okay, but what what am I grateful for? Like what 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 can I find some gratitude for even in this bad situation? This is a question that can't be overused. It's impossible to overuse it. So yeah, I think as frequently as you can kind of keep that question top of mind to always have in your toolbox to to pull out when negativity shows up, the better off you're going to be with positioning some of those seed thoughts to be the right positive thoughts that go down that full chain and ultimately show up in the results that you're wanting to see. Awesome. Well said. Anything else that you think is important for us to know or do that's going to help us really have that performance mindset? Yeah, I think it's just, you know, kind of going back to when we think about the fear of failure, when we think about the comfort zone, when we think about complacency, I I think it's just so important to remember that there is no substitute for action. Inaction is always the killer of, uh, the killer of our dreams and and goals. If you want to, if you want to tell me or, or ask me what's the one thing you can do to crush your goals, uh, in a bad way, I would say inaction. And so, yeah, I think there's just no, no substitute for it. And when we can take action, when you, we can use failure as a learning mechanism, we're just always going to be in a position for continuous improvement. And when we can show up every single day looking to take action, looking to improve, get 1% better every single day, that can compound into extraordinary uh, and amazing results. And so I think we all have the opportunity to give ourselves to show up every single day to get better. So why not take the action to do that? Yeah, there there is no upside to inaction. Wow. I think you gave us a lot of great advice and information today that can really help us change our mindset to get the outcomes that we're looking for. And I really appreciate you sharing your valuable time with us. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. And thinking on Aaron's recommendation about gratitude, overall, keeping a gratitude journal can be a very powerful tool for you improving your mental and emotional well-being and enhancing your overall quality of life. To download my complimentary gratitude journal, go to accountabilitycoach.com forward slash gratitude. That's accountabilitycoach.com forward slash gratitude and learn to be even more grateful for all the things that you have every single day to help you increase your performance mindset. Well, my hope for our time together with Aaron is that you got value and an idea or two that will help you be even more successful professionally and personally. Feel free to share my podcast with others as it can be found on most podcast platforms and in most English speaking countries. And if you'd like to get a short daily fix from me, subscribe to the Accountability Minute, which can also be found on most podcast platforms and in most English speaking countries and, of course, at accountabilitycoach.com. Want more proven business success tips and resources? Of course you do. So subscribe to my blog by going to accountabilitycoach.com forward slash blog. And always remember to aim for what you want each and every single day. Until next time, make it a great day, today and every day. I appreciate you listening.